Elizabeth interviewed you. Um, welcome, Dina. Um, I had the honor and pleasure of um, participating in the interview that Elizabeth did with you some weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And you are you are a woman of words, literally writing, teaching, coaching, author. Um, and you've written this book, Nermina's Chance, about the Bosnian War and what war does to the fabric of a human being, mental, emotional, uh, what war does to the fabric of society and what women in particular have to face because of decisions that are made to enter into war. And I do not want to take away any more time from from what you will have to share with us. So um, I welcome Dina Greenberg, author of Nermina's Chance. The book is set in the context of the Bosnian War and explores the topics of um, women dealing with post-traumatic stress. It explores the topic of um, refugees in another land. It explores the topics of adoption and uh, parenting and single parenting and also transcending, transcending circumstances and facing the truth. And sometimes truth cannot be varnished. So welcome, Dina. Thank you. And I just have to uh, say that, Donna, could you say something quick? Yeah, one one of the things I wanna add about um, understanding what Dina wrote about, and I'm, I'm so needing to order the book and I apologize for that, Dina, I've been meaning to do that, is, This was a war like too many others where civilians became targets. You know, in the military context, when we go to war, we expect to go forces on forces. We don't expect to kill civilians. Now, unfortunately, it may happen because of an accident, but they're never the primary uh, reason that we're there. Unfortunately, in the Balkans, (laughs) because it was a genocide, different fractions of different groups were breaking apart and for different reasons, ethnically, culturally, and religious, and for, for religious purposes, instead of living in harmony like they had for decades, generations, they suddenly decided because they didn't have an overarching ruler anymore, which was a dictator named Tito. When he died, the country began to kind of slowly fall apart. And when that thread of the society fell apart and just disintegrated, people, old grievances and distrust of people and all those kinds of negative attributes about human behavior all came to a boil. And people began to not just resent their neighbor, but want to kill them. And it became a very um, toxic environment where unfortunately, like so many wars that we've seen, like we're viewing right now in Ukraine, the, the fragile people in the society become the worst targets of all, the children, the women, the elderly, anybody that's in a situation where they, they can't get away quickly, right? They're, they're not armed for combat because they're not part of the fielded forces. So they're left behind to fend for themselves and they end up getting killed in the process. And with Putin, of course, he is deliberately targeting the civilians in Ukraine to topple that regime and to basically annihilate the, the, the Ukraine people. A similar situation was going on in what Dina's book highlights, which is a genocide among different factions of different people within what used to be called Yugoslavia and fell apart into different factions and different groups. They've had a piece there now, a fragile piece since 1999, but it wouldn't take much for it to erupt again. And that's what makes this such a sad story. Mm -hmm. Um, You think that you've dealt with the problem and people are back living together in what you'd call harmony, or at least you know they're, they're not killing each other anymore, but it doesn't take much to light a spark that starts it again. So I'd be, be honest with you if I said that um, I fully expect that at some point there'll be a problem in the Balkans again, that the former Yugoslavia and all of its dear people at some point may erupt in another genocide. It's, it's awful to say that, but that's my, um, viewpoint having you know been over in Europe for quite a while during the Balkan Wars and the many different um, situations we had to deal with because soldiers don't like to deal with a genocide it's not something we're prepared for we're prepared to deal with a fielded enemy force you know people in uniform and people that we're expecting to to go toe-to-toe with we don't expect to see unfortunately hundreds and hundreds of people 
murdered and dumped into mass graves. They are still finding max, ma mass graves in Yugoslavia people. It has not stopped. We're still trying to find all those people that died over there. It's, it's not easy, but we still continue the mission to find those people because their families deserve an accounting. Well, guess what's happening in Ukraine? People are also being buried in mass graves because there isn't time to do individual burials. So it's sad to see this pattern repeating. And I'm glad that Dina has you know, brought to our attention a horrific side of war that we should never let happen again. I'll put it that way. It should never happen again. That's my two cents worth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna, for providing us that context because that context underlies all wars. So over to you, Dina. Thank Would you. you like to read us something from the, an excerpt from the book, Dina? I, I am going to. Um, Fantastic. I'm going to have a little bit of a lead in first, but I want to say, um, I want to begin by thanking Donna um, and every service member um, who has been a part of uh, this war and so many others, um, especially when it comes to a scenario like this, which, which no one can imagine. Um, what Donna said was never again. Those are the very, those are the first words that are, I'm, I'm going to begin with. Never again. For more than 80 years, Jews across the globe have repeated these words again and again. But in recent years, authoritarian regimes have committed genocide again and again. In 1992, the world witnessed the rise of nationalism, bigotry, and religious hatred in the former Yugoslavia. Again, the world witnessed what can only be called genocide. I am Jewish. I carry the psychic and spiritual wounds of Jews who perished at the hands of those who hate us. My novel, Nermina's Chance, tells another story though, the story of a Bosnian Muslim family forever changed by war. It's just one small story, one particular story that represents many. People persecuted because they've been labeled other. Nurbina Boganovic is a medical student in Sarajevo when the war begins. From that moment on, she is driven by her trauma, driven by her losses, and despite this, or because of this, she's utterly determined to recreate the family that has been stolen from her. How does she do this? Nermina's decisions are unconventional, and they are risky. They are colored by the trauma she's endured. But rather than a story that focuses solely on Nermina's tragic past, this story shows readers how one woman travels beyond her pain to create her own family. This story reveals the unbreakable tie between a mother and her daughter. In the end, each says, never again, never again will their family be broken. So why this story? I start here because each time I sit down for an interview or take part in a book discussion group, the first question I'm asked is, why did you write this book? Why Bosnia? So more than 15 years ago, when I first began research for Nermina's Chance, I doubt I had the answer, but I knew one thing, I couldn't look away. Nermina's Chance begins in 1992 Bosnia during a campaign of genocide and rape that was perpetrated by Serb military police and paramilitary police forces on Bosnian Muslims and Croat civilians. Nationalism and religious hatred were the fuel that snuck out the lives of 100,000 people and wounded 500,000 others. Countless more make up the diaspora forced to flee Bosnia and other countries throughout the Western Balkans. And still, there's a statistic that's much more elusive, and that is the number of women and girls who are systematically imprisoned and raped. Estimates range as high as 60,000. 
In this war and most others, sexual violence was used as a lethal weapon intended to terrorize populations, destroy community and family bonds, and influence demographics. This was an integral component of strategically of strategies deployed in the Balkan Wars. Nomina, the protagonist in, in my novel, she suffered the physical, psychic, and spiritual wounds of rape. Her trauma is front and center in my book, and it's inevitable that she passes down this trauma to her daughter, Atika. So the chapter that I'm about to read you is entitled The Study. Here, Atika is just a small child. This chapter illustrates how trauma, especially the trauma of war and displacement, begins the cycle of intergenerational trauma. So in the book, forgive me if I'm reading, I'm trying to look up and not down at a book, so I've got it on a board. Um, so in the book, chapter 27, the study, um, it's about um, not, not quite halfway through the book, um, and Atika is a small child. Atika creeps down the staircase in woolly darkness that seems to swirl all around her in changing patterns. She knows not to switch on the light and avoids the floorboard two paces from the bottom of the stairs. The one that will produce a creak, not loud, but loud enough to awaken her mother. She touches her fingers to the wall and pads silently through the dining room then freezes, imagining herself like a white-tailed deer she and her cousins had seen on their hike with their uncle Samir just the week before. She stands outside a set of glass-paned French doors and on tiptoe, presses her small face to one of the squares. Her breath clouds the glass as she strains to see into the room that Atika and her mother call the study. This is where wooden bookshelves stretch all the way to the ceiling. And so a long time ago, her mother had put all their favorite books, the ones she'd read to Atika when she was just a baby, plus all the books Atika can now read by herself on the bottom shelves well within her reach. The fancier books, the ones her mother collects at flea markets and auctions, sit on the top shelves. And these she's only allowed to look at with her mother's permission because reaching them requires a ladder. This is one of the things her mother is very strict about. As her eyes adjust to the darkness, the blur of her mother's figure comes slowly into focus. She sees her there curled tightly in the bentwood rocking chair, covered up to her chin with a soft blue afghan, one of the many Aunt Rifa has made for them over the years. Something tugs harder inside Atika and then makes her eyes sting. She hears her mother's words. You're a big girl now, eight years old, and she knows this is true, but she longs now to climb into her mother's lap to breathe in the lemony smell of her mother's skin and just be held. She fights the jumble of feelings as best she can, dabbing with her eyes at the tears that run now hot on her cheeks along the lines of her chin. You're not a baby, she tells herself sternly. In her head, she mimics her mother's tone not the usual one that is mostly patient, but the sound of her mother's voice during what she calls her sad times. These always pass in a couple days. And even during the worst of it, her mother never yells or spanks her. So what is there to be afraid of? She can't say exactly, but she knows that she hates the feeling more than any other hates feeling more like the crybaby her cousin Sabrina has begun to taunt her with. And then 
Rather than climbing the stairs and returning to her bed, she slowly turns the smooth glass doorknob cold on her fingers all the way to the right. The brass tumbler clicking, the panes of glass rattling only slightly. Still, this is enough. She hears the sharp intake of her mother's breath and knows at once that she's been crying too. Mama, she says, her small hand still on the doorknob, her voice a whisper. She pushes just a little, the door making a tiny creak, and then her mother returns no answer. The girl slips into the room through the narrow opening she's made. She nearly runs across the wooden floor, stopping only when her toes feel the thick carpet at the far end of the room where her mother is tucked into the rocker. The tall windows behind her mother reveal a nighttime darkness much deeper than inside her room. And this too frightens the girl. Mama, she thinks she said, but she realizes that even this isn't right, that the tiny voice has only sounded inside her head. The girl freezes once more. And again, she thinks of the frightened deer how it appeared on the ridge like a ghost. And Uncle Samir had put a finger to his lips, instructing them wordlessly to stand silent on the trail. Her mother shifts in the chair and Atika sees one slender arm slip from behind the blanket, her fingers reaching for the lamp beside her. She hears the click as her mother pulls the brass chain and the girl blinks in the soft light but seems to move out in rays like in the pictures she'd drawn of the sun when she was little. I'm sorry, mama, she says aloud. What do you need, Atika? You should be asleep. Atika hears it right away, the tone she'd been dreading. It's been hiding there all along, just as she'd imagined, coiled inside her mother's words, like a snake, in one of the picture books her mother read to her before she could read them on her own. Her heart thumps hard, but Atika runs the few paces across the carpet to her mother anyway. In the lamplight, her mother's face seems thinner than in the daytime, gray shadows smudged under her eyes and cheekbone, like a scary mask. The girl's face flushes, hotter and still, she shivers a little. Goosebumps rise on her arms against the thin cotton of her nightgown. You weren't in your room, Atika says. You weren't in your bed. I'm here, her mother says. She draws the afghan her, uh, around her body. I'm right here. Atika sees that her mother still has on the same clothes she'd worn the day before. A pair of jeans and a dark green sweater with three buttons along her collarbone. Loose strands of her mother's hair that have escaped a sloppy ponytail hang limp against her forehead and across her cheeks. She knows that her mother hasn't showered and that stale smell of her clothing and her body makes Atika a little queasy. She reaches out and places her hand on her mother's cheek, feels the streaks of wetness there. Her mother turns her face away then, a harsh movement that tightens the knot in Atika's stomach. You need to go back to bed, her mother mouths the sentence as though reading it from the pages of a book, but with none of the animation she'd add if this were actually the case. Her mother's voice is blank, a blank page. Can I stay down here with you, Mama? No, you may not. It's late. It's her mother reaches for a little brass clock that sits on the base of the lamp and brings it close to her face. It's 2.30, she says. She sounds a bit surprised, but otherwise uninterested. You need to go upstairs now, her mother replaces the clock, but nothing more. The room is still silent, except for the low thud of the heating system as it comes on and then a light rustle of papers on the antique desk in front of one of the windows. 
Achika waits what seems a very long time for her mother to brush the messy strands of hair from her face, to smile at her, or even to chase her down and tickle her the way she used to when Atika was little. But as, as the seconds tick past on the little clock, Achika knows that her mother isn't going to do any of those things. Instead, the girl knows that she's going to have to set the little alarm clock in her bedroom for 6.45 a.m because it's unlikely her mother will be waking her with a kiss on the forehead in the morning. She knows she'll have to call Aunt Rifa to tell her that her mother will be staying home from work. She'll pour her own cereal and try not to spill any of the milk on the counter. She'll pack her own bologna sandwich and an apple. And she'll walk three blocks to the bus stop and wait for the other children for the school bus. Atika looks at her mother once more, and again, her face seems as cold and still as the statues in the park. She looks up at the tall bookcase and the fancy desk and where her mother writes out the bills. She loves this room because this is where her mother has always read to her. And she hates this room because this is the place where her mother hides when she's sad. Then the girl turns away from her mother and drifts like a little ghost through the slim opening. She shuts the French doors behind her. Clutching the banister starts up the carpeted stairs. The light from the study clicks off just as she reaches the top step, leaving the child alone and in the darkness. So this is the end of this chapter. And what I want to say is that in my work as, as an author, um, as an editor and a teacher and a writing coach, I have learned the importance of inviting people to share their stories. And often the stories begin with trauma that are, are frightening um, or contain some sort of shame or sorrow in the person's past. By bearing witness, by listening deeply, this is the most valuable gift that we can bestow. So holding these stories sacred, even if these stories are hard ones, this is the one way we can impact the world and a world where people seem to be destined to continue to endure the pain of war. So while I understand, especially now, while another war is taking place, that it's easy to feel hopeless. But I want to also say that I, I find an unimaginable hope in speaking with people and having the privilege of holding their stories and holding them sacred. Thank you. Dina, I shared the book with a friend of mine and she had she asked me to ask a question on her behalf. She couldn't join today. Yes. She wants to know why did Nirmina want children so badly? Knowing what she went through and knowing what their legacy would be. Why did she want a child? Yes, she, she wanted a child because she had lost her whole family. Okay. And she thought that being able to have that one aspect of her life in her control, in her total control, that that was a way for her to provide a legacy and to replace, not that you can ever mm -hmm. replace someone who has been taken, but the idea that she was going to be able to become a mother mm -hmm. and to continue and that's not to say, uh, we, we had talked about this in, right. in our interview, she's not a perfect mother. Right, right. I, yeah. Yeah. Does anyone yeah. else have questions? Yeah, Harold is going to leave. Harold has, uh, is, thank you for your service with the US Air Force. He's now retired. Did you, were you in any wars before he leaves? He has an appointment. We can't hear you.
I think he's muted, Elizabeth. Okay, okay. There. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, I came in at the tail end of the uh, Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. I uh, controlled airplanes, uh, and uh, but I never had the, I don't know if you want to say opportunity or what, uh, to uh, control any of the F-4 fighters and things like that. I was involved mostly with training inside the states and in, uh, in uh, the Philippines and uh, uh, Alaska. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, one of the assignments we had were to watching watching the border between uh, United States and Russia. Yeah. And uh, we all used to we used to play games. They'd fly over, and our guys would we would call our guys from Elmendorf to come up, fly and investigate. They would fly back across the border and they'd fly up the border shoot pictures of each other and things like that. But um, that was just some of the things that, uh, you know, that I did when I was in the military, in the Air Force. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I seem to hear a common topic in most of the, the, the themes that everybody here is talking. And it's, it's uh, uh, Lisa's, uh, Lisa Baker's uh, reading and writings and things like that. And it's all come to uh, what we call uh, connect, connection. She and both Tisha, Tisha Jackson, saying, yeah, well, we, we're connected with our husbands at times, but we, we need to connect with each other to help that we don't, you know, we need that support behind us. We don't want anybody sneaking up behind us and attacking us from the back, you know, as far as our lives are concerned. And so if everybody was honest with each other and everybody took care of their own roles in life and what they're supposed to be, you know, it's not a, it's not a, 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 a it's not a, a, a racial thing. <clears throat> it's not a sociological thing. It's, a, it's a, it's something psychological that goes on with us that makes us do these things. And believe me, you know, some, some the guys are sometimes the same way. You know, and each one of us, if we were all to, to commit to each other, the loyalty that we do we'd be able to straighten out, straighten out a whole lot of things. Even our government, you know, we, we don't even trust the government you know, in most cases, you know? Uh, uh, and so um, uh, I, I applaud you all. You all are just so impressive. Uh, the, the people who are speakers and the young ladies and, and, and all and Sister Dina, you know, with, with her background in the military and things, you all just got so much to contribute to the world. And that, as a group right here, you can start your commitment right here to each other. And if you commit to each other, it's going to fan out and span out to other ladies and other people who should do. We need to do the same thing on our side too. The men, yes, we do. We need to, we need a lot. We don't talk much, but we do a lot. You know, it's not all right, you know, but we all need to come together. So uh, again, what I got out of this whole thing was uh, uh, connecting. And in each one of the books, the books that were written by each one of the ladies here, they're all involving the right connection. And that's what we all have to uh, attune to. Uh, and um, what I'm off to right now is something that uh, uh, Elizabeth had uh, hooked me up with uh, at the YMCA and getting my, uh, my blood, uh, blood tests and things done correctly and uh, diabetes and all this stuff. I don't have diabetes, but just like all of us, we're all borderline. <laughs> Looks like everybody's <laughs> borderline this and borderline that. But uh, uh, again, I applaud every one of you. And this is actually the start. And this is the actually, actually it gives you, each one of you ladies, it gives you a name of someone. And right now through technology, now we have the faces of each one that is somebody you can tie up with, you can connect with and talk with about your subjects. It's gonna help you to expand also the subject matter that you're writing about. And the, each one's gonna, you, you're gonna have, when you leave this meeting, you're gonna have a few more little corners, I know in your heart and in your head that you're going to use in your future writings. So again, I thank you Elizabeth for always pulling me into these things and let me listen. I'm, I'm, I'm behind the stage looking at you all do your thing. And you all do a great thing with what you do. You so know, God bless, God bless each and every one of you. Thank you, Harold. Thank Harris, you. Harold's wife is one of the best bakers in town. 
<laughs> and she makes all these sweets and cakes and eyes. And, and so, yeah, I'll see you. I'm actually in the same program. So I'll meet you there. Uh, okay. I'll be great. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, Olene, Olena is next, uh, Ramona. Yes. And yes um, welcome, Olene.